I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute. Welcome to the NEI Podcast. On this show, I sit down with renowned mental health care experts from a range of diverse backgrounds to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental health conditions. In this episode of the NEI Podcast, we are discussing serious mental illness and Fountain House. It is such an honor and privilege for me to get to interview three very important people who are heavily involved in Fountain House. Welcome, Dr. Francesca Pernice. Thank you. Dr. Jeannie C. Hi. And Cyrus, you're going to have to tell me your last name. Sorry. Napolitano. Five Napolitano. Easy. I'm going to let you... <laughs> I'm going to let you pronounce that. That was beautiful. Welcome all of you to our show. It is so great to have you on here. We've wanted to do this for a while. And my first question for you is, how did Fountain House come to be? I understand that there's a lot of history behind it. Can you share that with us? Perhaps, Cyrus? Sure. Sure. I'll jump in and, and start us off on that. And then Francesca and Jeannie, if you remember anything that I have forgotten, but back in 1944, towards the end of World War II, there were a group of gentlemen who came out of Rockland State Hospital. And, you know, they started meeting on the steps of the main branch of the New York Public Library on 42nd Street and 5th Avenue. Everybody has seen photographs of that. And they came mm -hmm. together to mutually support each other in finding a place to live and finding employment and supporting each other. Right. And in the beginning, they called themselves one out. We are not alone, which oh, is wow. the motto of Fountain House for next year will be 75 years that we've been in existence. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it's really goes to the very core, the very essence of what Fountain House is all about is supporting each other in recovery and the individual goals and objectives that each member has and coming together to make sure that these things actually occur. Mm -hmm. In 1948, it became a little bit more formalized with the incorporation of the Fountain House Foundation. Oh, foundation, yep, yep. Right, okay. and moved to a location on West 47th Street and Hell's Kitchen of all places, mm -hmm. a five block walk from the cent from the crossroads of the world, Times Square. And Times we've, Square. Been there. we've been there ever since. We were in a building wow. across the street that was eventually taken over by the a New Yorker magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and we've grown and developed into multiple two main buildings on West 47th Street between 9th and 10th Avenue. We have a, a number of residential buildings. We have a, a senior residence down the block. We have mm -hmm. a guest house where we, two brownstone, lovely brownstones right next door where we have colleagues from all over the world who come to train with us. Mm -hmm. Then wow. in the early uh, 50s, John Beard, who became the executive director of Fountain House, was working at a facility, Eloise. In, in Detroit, shout out. Shout out, Detroit. <laughs> Wayne Detroit. State. And he was very innovative. He became the executive director. And that's where yeah. the innovations that have taken place over the decades actually occurred. Francesca, oh, wow. I don't know if you want to add a little bit more about John Beard, but this was also at the time of deinstitutionalization taking place. Mm -hmm. in the U.S. And I don't know if oh, you want to yes. talk a little bit about that and the importance yes, of developing community programs to address the needs of people who are coming out of mental health facilities in the U.S. Well, I think what Beard really contributed is humanity. You know, Cyrus, yeah. you know, he believed we all had purpose and meaning and given that this illness was, let's just take psychosis, affects men without meaning. I mean, Viktor Frankl talked about that in his own. But essentially seeing that when he saw people gathering and collaborating on a shared goal or even, a you know, something that there was purpose and meaning behind, symptoms went away. The illness sort of took a back seat. And he was like, something is happening here. How we're structuring our societies is not <clears throat> making space for everyone. <clears throat> and I think that was what he really brought to the 
to where it came to be is this the humanity of it. And so we've now come to a place where we say, you know, this is a place, it's a place, we know that, with people and with purpose, which is oh, yeah. taken from what Tom Insel now, and, you know, we'll kind of circle back who has joined the board, you know, where Fountain House has come to be, you know, join the board of Fountain House now and sort of really highlighting the importance of this model. Wow. I just wanted to mention, too, that this is an international model that Fountain House started 75 years ago. It's almost our anniversary, but that it quickly picked up. And there are 330 clubhouses around the world now. You know, there's Clubhouse International is an organization that accredits all these clubhouses and keeps us all together. And I think the idea of social practice that I think Francesca is going to talk more about is it has been really galvanizing in terms of giving a language to what we do in Clubhouse and how mm -hmm. all over the world, from Lahore, Pakistan, to many countries in Scandinavia, all of these places are using the same model to help people. And in places where there's very little mental health care access as well, mm -hmm. this is a model mm -hmm. that could really bring hope. Wow. Right. And the other thing that I want to build off of what Dr. C and Francesca have said, you know, treating people with dignity and respect, mm -hmm. not, not focusing on the illness. Now, I've been a member for over 13 years. Mm -hmm. I've been mm -hmm. working with members that whole time. Very rarely do I ever get into discussing somebody's diagnosis with them, unless right. there is a situation that arises where they may be in some sort of crisis situation or they're experiencing some negative aspects of their illness. Mm -hmm. But overall, this is a strength-based approach, which is really very innovative and creative. And how revolutionary to treat people with serious mental illness with dignity and respect and focusing on basic human rights. And, you know, it, and it's partnerships that you develop not just between the member and other members, but with members and what we call social practitioners, yeah. relationships that you develop with the psychiatrist and the therapist. <laughs> so it's a very integrated approach. And Dr. C can talk more about that community system of care, which we have developed. Wow. I love all of this. It's so inspirational and so powerful. So before I get into my next question, I just want to highlight what your individual roles are. So we have Dr. Francesca Pernice, you're the Director of Counseling Psychology at Wayne State University. And can you tell us more about how you came into your role at Fountain House, how you became involved? And then I'd like to turn to each of you in a similar way. I'll introduce what your title is and let's talk about your journey. Okay, sure. I'm going to make it really succinct. So I came into understanding the clubhouse model when I went to pursue my doctoral studies at Michigan State University and worked with a group of community psychologists and people from the Department of Community Health. And somebody had come to Fountain House and said, hey, we need to shut down our day hospitals. We need to convert these programs into clubhouses and we need to shut down the hospitals. And it was during a time in the 90s where we had Governor Engler involved in really reallocating money. And so I came in as a graduate student who had clinical background and they needed somebody to manage this project. And it was the launch of really studying clubhouses in Michigan I came to Fountain House as I did my work in Michigan, which now has the largest number of clubhouses, I think, in the United States, wow. um, was sort of invited by Alan Doyle, the, Dr. Alan Doyle, who was the previous director of the Center for Leadership and Education, to coordinate mm -hmm. an effort into creating Fountain House as an educational center. We started with the learning exchange model. And so I've been involved with them ever since and have really integrated my students. I've been teaching about Clubhouse for 17 years and been working wow. in research with clubhouses for about 22 years now. Wow. So I was just like, whoa, when Fountain House asked me to come and hang out with them, I was like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> oh, absolutely. That's great. Great. Thank you so much for that. 
So next we have Dr. Jeannie C., who's the medical director at Fountain House. Can you tell us how you became involved in Fountain House and what is sort of your role like being there? Sure. So one thing the Center for Leadership and Education does is educate psychiatry residents and fellows, trainees, about Fountain House, Clubhouse, and what it can offer in terms of the whole range of behavioral health supports that are available in the community. And we do this through a program developed by my predecessor and a large international advisory board called Partners in Care. So 16 years ago, I came on a tour of Fountain House when I was doing the Columbia Public Psychiatry Fellowship Program, and I was just blown away by how different it was from any other model of mental health treatment, how much it supported the best of people, and how you really could not tell walking around who was a member and who was a staff because everyone was contributing uh, to the wellness of this place. Right. And I loved it. You know, there's there are a lot of people who have been at Fountain House for a very long time because I think you fall in love with it and you stick around. But yeah, Dr. Aquila was here for 30 years. And, and you know, he and I ran into each other over the, the past 15 years. I had spent that time at the Institute for Community Living, became their chief medical officer. But a few times over the years told Ralph that when he was done with his job, I was interested, I would take it. And then he was, you know, ready to retire. And I was more than happy to take it on. And I've just been so, you know, privileged to be part of this community and to be accepted here and hopefully to give back as much as I can. So what my role is to ensure that every member of Fountain House has access to good clinical care in the community. And um, I help with things like the Center for Leadership and Education and just the quality of care that we provide at Fountain House. And then we have Cyrus, who is a Fountain House member and is also co-director of the Clubhouse Coalition in New York. Cyrus, can you share with us your story, how you came, how you became involved in Fountain House and what is it like in your role? So of the of many of the many different things I've done over the years, the many opportunities that have been afforded me because I've started coming to Fountain House on a more regular basis. Mm -hmm. It was very challenging in the beginning because I had a lot of stigma against people with serious mental illness, myself included, which is a very weird and kind of bizarre place to be. And I had to recognize that and I had to work through that. And that took time and it took time and allowed me uh, to really get to know the members of our community and working with them and just sitting down and having a cup of coffee and getting to know a person. And, you know, I applied for the open position on the board of directors and sat on the board for seven years. And you know, I was on the finance committee. I'm, a, I'm on the buildings and residences committee. I helped develop the Silver Center and I would give regular reports to the board itself on the development of that program. I became wow. involved in designing and getting ready to build, hopefully soon, a new clubhouse in the South Bronx because we do have a sister clubhouse that we organized and developed. Mm -hmm. in the South Bronx that has outgrown the space. And because there is this huge unmet need mm -hmm. in the city of New York for services and supports for people with serious mental illness. And that, that means we're helping people with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, of mm -hmm. bipolar disorder, of major depression and schizoaffective disorder. These are people who are marginalized and discriminated against it doesn't matter where you are in the world, whether you're here in the U.S. or in the slums of Kolkata. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar, you are more likely than not going to be the victim of the crime, not the perpetrator of crime. Right. And this is where a place like Fountain House is really important mm -hmm. because having a place like Fountain House in the community that interacts with the community, 
it's not separate from the community, is involved with the community board and with the politician and really becoming involved and letting people know that just because you have a serious mental illness diagnosis does not mean you cannot be a participant in the community and society. Right. Right. You go from being a passive recipient mm-hmm. service, services to becoming an active participant in the community and society at large. Right. That's right. really fundamental to recovery. It demonstrates to professionals, particularly psychiatrists, and let's say nurse practitioners, that recovery is possible when you have the necessary services and supports for the individual. I've been on the Fountain House Council, which has had many iterations over the years. Currently, I'm working with the Research and Knowledge Department at Fountain House on doing some more research, which we have done over many years, and Francesca can certainly speak to that. Again, developing a clubhouse in the South Bronx, being involved in colleague training, develop the social practice curriculum, Mm -hmm. developing the partners in care curriculum, which is geared towards psychiatrists and other mental health professionals. I've had the opportunity to represent Fountain House around the world. So I've been to Europe multiple times. I've been to India twice. I've been to Australia. Um, I actually helped organize a national seminar in Nairobi, Kenya, just two and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. And a wow. planning meeting in Bungoma. And we're developing a community-based program in, in a smaller city of Kenya on the border with Uganda. So the many opportunities that have been afforded me to represent Fountain House and speak on behalf of people with serious mental illness And showing people that just because I have a diagnosis doesn't mean I cannot cannot contribute to the community and to society at large. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful thing. So I hope that answers some of people's questions regarding what the what Fountain House and clubhouses around the world can do for people with a diagnosis. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So my next question is. What is social practice and how does it relate to mental health recovery? What are the five principles of social practice? Dr. Pernice, do you think that you would like to comment on this? Yes, I will. I can start it off and then maybe just bounce it around with examples, if you don't mind, Cyrus and Jeannie. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So social practice is essentially a method that is practiced in clubhouses, so I'm sort of defining it by its context, but also can be practiced outside of clubhouse environments. But it's a method of using spaces, structure, relationships, purpose, meaning to intervene at a social level. And so it's creating an intentional place with people and purpose It's creating community that nurtures the need to be needed, which then enhance self-efficacy and individual recovery experiences. And so essentially it's derived, it derives in its theory of change, not just as an individual experience, but also an experience that is enhanced and achieved through and within community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Is there anything that anyone else would like to add to that? I can, in terms of, you know, Cyrus can speak, how is this not other types of programs? How is social practice, you know, social practice sets the therapeutic environment in the clubhouse. It's by no means, it's practiced by everyone, whether you're a member or, you know, a social practitioner. It's sort of the design of the environment. It's designed to create safety in our abilities to take risks and support personal growth. So how is it social practice sets it apart from partial hospitalization programs, day hospital programs. It essentially creates a place in our community for everyone. And it's, you know, we don't question the purpose of schools. <laughs> right. In similar ways, right. clubhouses are yet another setting that mm-hmm. is part of the community. 
there are a couple of things that I can speak to related to social practice. It really is the development of language to explain what actually occurs at Fountain House and other clubhouses around the world. Mm -hmm. In the past, we talked about things like the magic of Fountain House or the Mm -hmm. special sauce. If you're talking to somebody from the World Health Organization or a potential funder, that kind of language does not translate into something that is understandable and relatable to them. So this gives us the language where we can better give our elevator pitch, where we can explain what actually occurs. And it it provides an understanding to the community as to what is actually occurring. For example, it's very important as a member, when you first come to Fountain House, that you're engaged in what we call the work order day that you build relationships, not just with the social practitioner, but with everyone else in the community. And that can take on many different forms. We're talking about the the intentional community utilizing social practice. So if you were to visit Fountain House or any other clubhouse around the world, Mm -hmm. it's not a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. We have artwork all throughout the building. We Mm -hmm. have plants all throughout the building. It's designed to be more like a home environment than a clinical setting of a hospital or a doctor's office or Mm -hmm. a therapist's Mm -hmm. office. So they can have very nice environments, but it really is to engage people in the work of the day because we utilize work as a tool. We use community as a tool to help promote recovery. Yeah, and so a lot of what, you know, the environment that's created is really created by everyone. So, you know, the writing about social practice, documenting this method comes with, you know, meetings and weekly dedication to talking about it, identifying, but it's built together with, you know, we have a great community of folks that are contributing to the development of this term, social practice, really putting And it really addresses, you know, organizational level interventions as well as interpersonal level. But it is essentially a dynamic ecosystem that's Mm -hmm. functioning like any other busy office building, like any (laughs) other library, like any other environment. People are bustling and moving around. And so when we talk about what are what are the elements of this model, what are the principles of this model, you know, Together with folks with Fountain House members, different researchers, students, social practitioners, we're all gathering to really describe this method. And so mm-hmm. one of mm-hmm. the elements is social design and really designing an environment, the physical or social space, to, fil- to facilitate communication, relationship building. What Elliot Madison, now who is the director at Fountain House, talks about feeling of togetherness and belonging, communitas. And so creating a space that is inviting, you know, just showing up to the green doors that have so many have gone through is also an inviting way of like coming in to that space. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a Fountain House member? What is a mental health clubhouse and how does someone join? Cyrus, did you want to take on this question first? Well, I can start us off. What does that mean to be a Fountain House member? I was giving that some thought. And we have some very basic things, I think, to kind of go over. The aspect of becoming a member of a clubhouse, in, and this is the most fundamental aspect of it, is the voluntary nature of the program and choice. And what do I mean by that? To become a member of Fountain House or any other clubhouse, you choose to be there. Mm -hmm. You're not mandated by a doctor or a court to participate in Fountain House. You are here because of your own free will and decision to become part of a community. And that's really critical to understanding what actually happened. And, And creating this environment where a member gets to choose when they want to participate in the program. How many days a week do they want to come into the clubhouse? What kind of work they want to do? Who they want to be what we call their worker or social practitioner? 
all of these choices, which can be overwhelming in the beginning, because for many members, this first time they've been actually asked the question, what do you want? You want to get out of Fountain House or any other clubhouse. What do you want to actually do? What are your goals and objectives? And in the mental health field, this is rather, or in life in general, because a lot of people think that because you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar or major depression or schizoaffective disorder, that somehow that limits your ability to actually participate in a community or society. Whereas we're providing the necessary services and supports to allow the individual to become empowered to really say, this is what I want. This is what right. I want to do. This is how I want to be engaged in the community. And again, it's revolutionary because there is so much stigma and discrimination and marginalization <laughs> of this population. And it does not matter where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. I gave a presentation a number of years ago where I showed a photograph of a man strapped to a stainless steel gurney with some sort of metal straps around his head and his arms and his leg mm -hmm. and his body. And when I presented that, I asked people to tell me where this photograph was from. And it was actually from a, an institution in Michigan USA. It was not in India. It was not in Africa. Wow. I saved that photograph and I always have it in the back of my mind because what we are doing is we're looking at the individual as somebody who has something to contribute to the community and society. You are creating this sense of agency and autonomy by creating opportunities where a member can grow and develop and do things that they never thought they can do. And it can be as basic as going to work for the first time in years or going back to school because the illness hits you at, you know, while you're starting thinking of a career and having a family. Right. And after 20, 30 years, you're saying, can I do this? I'm afraid taking risks. By creating an environment where people are included and not separated out because they have a mental health diagnosis, I want to know who you are as an individual when I meet you. I don't ask you what your diagnosis is. I don't ask you what medication you are on. I don't ask you if you are seeing a psychiatrist or a therapist or anything like that. I'm more interested as to who you are and what you're all about. And this is so critical to an individual's recovery, where you have this environment, this intentional community, where change is possible because of all of this structure that we have created at Fountain House and other clubhouses around the world, by having relationships where you get to know one another. Mm -hmm. So if I, as an individual member, and I'm starting to experience some symptoms that are affecting my ability to work or to go to school or to have a relationship. There are people that know me who can contact my psychiatrist and say, Cyrus is having some difficulty. Can we come in and see you? Maybe we need to make an adjust adjustment in medication. That's where you have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But in the day-to-day -day stuff that we do at Fountain House, it generally does not come up. Right. I think that also leads nicely into describing the practice in the clubhouse, right? Like social practice. You know, Cyrus described, you know, this place where you don't, you're not identified as a patient, a client. And as we think about how the clubhouse is organized, one of the central features that Cyrus was describing is something that is called the work order day. And mm -hmm. this provides structure to the community. And so we've been evolving together with Fountain House members, social practitioners to really concretize this method that is used in the clubhouse, which is now named social practice. Mm. 
And what Cyrus was describing were various things that happen in the house. And so the house might be divided into various units or departments. There's a culinary department, maintenance department or center, the education center, outreach center, communications, health and wellness. And so this model includes all these very normative business-like functions. However, Fountain House is not an ordinary place of business. And work and activities are not an end in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And so the notion is this city or work, meaningful work, is what drives individuals discovering parts of themselves, engaging in social situation, being drawn out from their isolation, being included where they were marginalized. And so this notion of social practice, this method, how it relates to mental health recovery is organizing an environment where individuals feel included, feel the need to be needed, and ultimately design what their recovery journey looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is so amazing. Well, thank you both for that input and just for sharing that information with us. I can answer the question of how does someone join the clubhouse, which was okay. one thing that you asked. But as I'm part of the enrollments and on-ramps functions at, at Fountain House, so there are many ways in which we try to get the word out, including probably this podcast, to people that clubhouse is an important treatment and rehabilitation option for folks. We do a lot of presentations, and we do hope that people who have experienced all that Clubhouse has to offer, whether by a presentation or a tour, will refer people to the Clubhouse. And what is required for that referral is the person's interest and a psych psychiatrist's attestation or evaluation that says that the person has a diagnosis of depression, bipolar disorder, or a schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. So it's pretty simple. One place that people can get help to do the application is by emailing join the club at fountainhouse.org. Well, someone just emails join the club at fountainhouse.org and gives a person's name and phone number, our team, our enrollment team will reach out to that person and walk them through the entire application process from soup to nuts. And actually, if they don't have a psychiatrist to do that attestation or evaluation, I, Dr. C, do, will do that for them. So, mm -hmm. so we take care of it all. In addition to, you know, using those kinds of referrals, we have many ways that people on ramp into to Clubhouse. One is, for example, in Times Square, you know, the home of Broadway in mm -hmm. New York City, mm -hmm. we have a, a recharge station where people can come and have a cup of coffee for free or plug in their phones or hang out. And at that recharge station, what we are really looking to do is to find people who are street homeless and who could use a cup of coffee or a phone plug in and engage them around, you know, do you need help with housing? Do you need help with food? Do you need help with clothing? And do you need some place to be, some place that accepts you, and some place where you can find healing and recovery from mental illness? And so mm -hmm. we bring a lot of people into the clubhouse through that uh, recharge station, at that kiosk in Times Square. We also bring people on through programs that outreach to Rikers Island to, to people who are mentally ill who have for whom found house can be an alternative to incarceration if they've been incarcerated because of something that happened when they were ill. Or, you know, we reach out across the city to people who are homeless so that people can get care. Mm -hmm. And so there are many ways to become a member of Fountain House, but ultimately a psychiatric diagnosis and an interest in being part of a community are all you need to join. Excellent. In what ways does Fountain House help members with employment? Can you share a little bit more about that? I'm happy to start this off. And I know, Francesca, you've done some research in this area. So please uh, jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are a number of ways that a Fountain House approaches employment. Because, you know, for someone who has lived with serious mental illness and maybe has spent some years in and out of hospital at the beginning of their adult life. I think the con the, you know, w uh, the process of getting to the point of being employed is actually very challenging. And so um, 
this townhouse provides a kind of scaffolding to get people up to speed. And I think first, the first step is for people to show interest in employment. And that starts with their work in the work order day that Francesca talked about that You know, just by getting involved in operating a clubhouse, in contributing, they show and find what their talents and interests are. And then their social practitioner, who is their, you know, a mentor in the clubhouse, might say, you know what, are you ready? Do you feel ready or interested to gain employment? And then they might go to our job seekers meeting and sit and learn about the different kinds of jobs available. And there are two main kinds of jobs. Um. One is transitional employment. These are jobs that Fountain House contracts with different agencies. For example, we work with Jackrabbit, which is an agency that delivers food to seniors. And the staff in the employment unit guarantee the jobs. And so we might have a member who every morning goes to deliver the food to the seniors. But if they have a day when they are too depressed to get out of bed or if they're hearing too many voices, the staff will go and do that job for them so that the person, despite the challenges of their illness, can maintain that employment. And the staff Mm -hmm. member will also, you know, accompany them on the job until they feel comfortable as well, if needed. So that's transitional employment that lasts usually only six months per job. But then there's supported employments and then, you know, very permanent employments. And Mm -hmm. the Employment Resource Center helps people work through getting first supported employment where people might know that you have, you come from Fountain House, you might have a a mental illness and that you might need more support and attention to Mm -hmm. be successful at your job. And then, you know, permanent employment that you get on the open market, the team in the Employment Resource Center will also help you to locate and keep those jobs. And so, you know, you do what you are able to do. And we're very proud of our employment rates at Fountain House. That's great. That's wonderful. I'll I'll just speak a little bit to the member experience. When I first became a member, you know, I had to learn to get acclimated to what we call the the work order day. And then I was speaking to the social practitioner and she wanted to know whether I would be interested in working. And of course, you know, living off of a disability check does not afford you the opportunity to do many things. So the chance to work was very enticing and I started working at an international law firm that Fountain House had a relationship that stretched back for about 15, 20 years. And, you know, it afforded me the chance to really test myself and see if I could hold down a job. And it really launched me into making sure that I was able to get up every single day and take a shower and brush your teeth, which are for somebody who is suffering, say, from major depression, these Mm -hmm. are challenges. And to be able to overcome them and to do what, quote unquote, normal people (laughs) do every single day is really a wonderful sense of accomplishment that you take away from that. And I developed a relationship with my supervisor. We're friends. You know, when I was having some difficulty at one point in time, she offered to take me to the hospital if I thought that's what I needed. Mm -hmm. So I had additional supports that in an, uh, an everyday job that you probably wouldn't get. So the sense of accomplishment is just really tremendous with a TE or an SE position. That's great. And just to add, you know, employment, which I think ultimately sometimes we say is that the ultimate measure of success and recovery, it still remains elusive. Mm -hmm. The model Mm -hmm. really uses the work order day as a structure to help folks find parts of themselves that have been lost to an illness. And so, you know, the fact that, you know, many folks that come to Clubhouse are employed when we have people with serious mental illness having the highest level of unemployment of any group with disabilities. This is really important. This right. is remarkable. Right. Yeah, absolutely. How does Fountain House get involved with education for people living with mental illness? One of our units at Found House is also actually the education unit. And 
most of the people that join that unit have, or many of the people that join that unit have some edu- interest in furthering their education or learning something. And that can be as, you know, from attending an art history class run by one of our members, which I really enjoyed, to working on getting your high school equivalent equivalency exam done. We have a college reentry program as well for people who had to leave their studies because of mental illness and its challenges. This program, you know, it provides a lot of support and actually you can live in our guest house while you pursue your education and it really helps people in their first year back to college to be successful. And so there are a number of ways that Fountain House does this. Yeah, I think Clubhouse models like Fountain House have used sort of the three-tiered model of employment where you have transitional employment, supported employment, and then ultimately what might be called competitive empl- employment where you're that's your job. Similarly with education, there are also sort of steps where you have supported education. And the Fountain House, really with the college re-entry program, which I have one of my doctoral students right now investigating, we're finding that, you know, mental illness is an illness that hits young adults. You know, the first episode may happen between the ages of 16 and 25, which is a major transitional period. And the college experience becomes very important. And so having, you know, more programs like college re-entry across different campuses would really address some of the issues of folks returning or main, or staying in, in educational settings. How does Fountain House help with housing and the homeless? Well, Fountain House has about, about 500, I think, beds of housing now, including wow. housing that is within congregate residences where you know, people share a kitchen and dining facility and have a lot of staff support to what we call scattered site apartments where people live either alone or with one or two other people in an apartment in the community. And a case manager comes to visit you and make sure that you have enough food and you're able to take care of yourself and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, and and so there's a lot of housing support. And Fountain House really prides itself in a very hands-on approach. If someone If a member needs housing, we pull out all the stops to make sure we do the housing applications, get the benefits in place, and prioritize getting housing as soon as possible. And this is especially important as we ramp up our on-ramps work that I spoke about earlier, where we're really trying to engage people who are street homeless, people coming out of Rikers, people who are shelter homeless. But, you know, we want to make housing available to people as soon as possible because it's really hard Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to get better um, and to pursue your recovery goals if you're sleeping in the street, frankly, you know, and or sleeping in a room of a hundred different people. You know, it's hard to, you don't get sleep and, and then, you know, the mental health symptoms don't get better and it's really hard to work or do anything useful. So this is a real priority for Fountain House. And I've I've worked in housing for the last, you know, couple decades, and I really am impressed by how hard found house workers work to get people housed. Wow. Wow. Okay. In what ways are the members of Fountain House involved in agriculture? I thought this is really interesting. A number of years ago, Fountain House was able, through the generosity of a family that had some property in Northwest Jersey, where their son, I believe, was suffering from schizophrenia and used to spend a lot of time on the property. And through their generosity, their wanting to help out Fountain House, they sold it to us for, I believe, $1, and it's 477 acres. And it's a working farm. We have uh, apple orchards. We have all types of animals from chickens to sheep to llamas and alpacas we have our we have our own maple trees where we get maple syrup every year we shear the alpacas and we get the wool and we make products out of that at one point in time we had one of our artists living there working on this very large project that actually won a very prestigious award But it's a chance for members and staff to really get out of the city and go be immersed in in the farm for 
a couple of days or for a weekend. And you see this change come over people because Mm -hmm. New York City is not the easiest place to live. It's very, you know, stressful and stuff like that. And you prepare meals together, you watch movies, you play games, you build a bonfire. There's a small lake where you can go swimming, get in the boat and paddle around for a while and, and stuff like that. And it's just a wonderful opportunity for people just to really see themselves in a different way because a lot of people have never been on a working farm. Mm-hmm. They don't understand what it means to take care of animals or, you know, one of the best things I ever did one day when I was at the farm is I, the apple orchard had been overgrown. So I took the weed whacker and I went there and by the end of the day, I was covered in green from head to toe, but it was a great <laughs> stress reliever. <laughs> Um, we have made films there as part of our multimedia department. It's just a wonderful environment for people just to really get to know each other outside of the work order day. There are things that have to be done. You have to take care of the animals. You have to take care of the gardens and things, but it's just a tremendous release, at least for me and many of my friends who used to go there on a regular basis. I haven't been in some time. During COVID, we had people living there for much, much longer periods of time, making sure the farm was taken care of. We have a farm manager and you know, he has a family that lives there and you know works very well with the members and the staff. So it's a wonderful blessing, to be honest. That is wonderful. I want to point out that it meshes very well with our culinary unit, too, that prepares breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the clubhouse every day. The eggs that we eat and the chicken meat, some of it, there's always a vegetarian option in our culinary unit, but the chicken does come from the farm. And, you know, in the fall, shortly after I joined Fountain House, I got to go apple picking and make apple cider. And then I got to drink the apple cider that I made here in the clubhouse. And for, I think, members and staff, anybody involved in this, the the opportunity that we rarely get nowadays to like be involved in food production and then food preparation and then food consumption is it really brings you back to nature, to our roots, to things that, that ground us. And I think that's really exciting. What is the Silver Center and what is the mission behind it? Cyrus, we did this one. Yeah, sure. Back in 2014 or 2013, depending on who you're talking to, we had one member in particular who unfortunately passed away recently, who is one of our silver members. And silver is a silver member is defined as anyone 55 and older. And okay. I fit in that category now. Okay. I wasn't in that category when I started working on the Silver Center project. Right, right. But we wanted to look at what life is like for people in that age range mm-hmm. who are no longer working. They're not in school. They may have an interest in taking some classes or anything, but they're not looking to build a career or start a family. They've done a lot of that already. So what do you do and how do you structure the day outside of the work order day to really engage those members? A lot of our older members may be in an assisted facility, a living facility, or they may be in a nursing home, or they may have mobility issues where they really can't travel very often. So this one member is like, well, what can we do for these members? We talk about membership at Fountain House is for life. And what does that actually mean Mm -hmm. for someone who's 55 and older? Mm -hmm. So we started meeting on a regular basis and started hammering out the details of what the Silver Center project would look like. We got a grant for about, I think it was $235,000 to actually build a Silver Center in our residential building right down the block from our main building, which houses about 18 or 19 Silver members as a 24-hour facility. These are people who need a lot more attention and care than somebody who is living Mm -hmm. independently. And in the basement, which I call the lower level because nobody wants to be in a basement, we actually spent a lot of time designing this space, working with an architect and really figuring out what it is that we wanted to do. And of course, we had very big ideas, very big dreams. 
But we also had to moderate that a bit because you can only do so much in a limited space. We ended up having meetings to design the programming aspect of it. What would the day look like? So instead of it being focused solely on work, we were incorporating what a senior center would do, which would have much more social activities. So playing games or maybe watching a movie and going out to the movies uh, like my friend does. He, he gets a group of members together to go to the movies. And some members haven't been to the movies in decades. And they would go out uh, afterwards and have some coffee and cake and talk about the movie and socialize and be engaged with each other. And it's become a very popular program within the wow. Silver Center itself. Of course, you know, making it more accessible. So visiting members mm -hmm. who are in a nursing home and bringing a tablet where they can participate in discussions and meetings using technology to really connect with people. Of course, over the past two plus year, because of the COVID pandemic, we were using technology across the board to really engage people in the work of the clubhouse and with the Silver Center. And we officially opened in October of 2018. And it is probably the most popular program within Fountain House today. It's oh, actually wow. outgrown the space. It's crowded all the time. Oh, that's great. And people are really engaged. They do flower arrangements and artwork and just sitting down and talking with each other and getting to know each other. And that's really so important to breaking yes. through the isolation and loneliness, yes. which exists for anybody with a serious mental illness diagnosis. But as you get older and mm -hmm. your family and friends, unfortunately, mm -hmm. pass away, you become very lonely. And this is a way to, to address the mortality rate of people with serious mental illness, dying like 12 to 25 years younger than the general population. Right. So right. I don't know if Dr. C wants to add on to that, or maybe Francesca has some additional insights. Yeah. I think that getting older for someone with serious mental illness in general in the community can be a very lonely process. And one thing that we as psychiatrists and as a mental health community really struggle with is that many assisted livings and nursing homes will not take people because of discrimination right. or mental illness. And then on the other hand, mental health residences are often not equipped to, to care for people with dementia or with very severe health problems, like requiring an oxygen tank, things like that. And so finding a place that really cares for people who are older with serious mental illness is, it's a gem. And, you know, Fountain House has created this and people like Cyrus, you know, made a wonderful <laughs> work order day centered day, pro you know, senior centered there too. I mean, this is not just a place where you show up to do activities run by somebody else. This is a place where you still contribute and you still give back to the community. And I think that's just mm -hmm. what absolutely. And another important aspect of this is we have a lot of our younger members who are interested in working with our silver members and they really. Oh, the intergenerational wonderful. gap. People are, there's the gap between somebody who's older and younger. There are a group of members who absolutely love working with the Silver Center members. And again, it's about building these relationships, about building friendships that last for years and years. Absolutely. That's great. That is wonderful. What is the Fountain House Gallery? Can you share a little bit more about that? Can I talk about this, guys? Because mm -hmm. the gallery is one of the shining lights of Fountain House for me. It was <laughs> one of the things that really attracted me the most. Many people with mental illness are brilliant artists. And mm -hmm. here at Fountain House, there is support through our studio to have materials to create art, to have a space full of light to create, That's and to wonderful. have people who are supportive of your process. Right. And so we get just amazing art coming out of our studio and out of people's, you know, our members working in their own homes too. And it's marketed to the public at our Found House Gallery on 48th Street and 9th Avenue in Manhattan, right in Hell's Kitchen, right next to Times Square. And you can see just the amazing work of our members. 
And online, you can go to found, just put found house gallery in and uh, on artsy.net, artsy.net, they will they show you all of the kinds of work that our members do. But outside of just being like a really wonderful way that the public can access the art of our members, for so many members, creating and showing parts of themselves is part of their recovery process. And I think much of the art shows something about identity and about the challenges of living with mental illness. We have one artist who paints portraits of psychosis. And, you know, there are some things you can't say in words. And when you look at his art, you really understand like some of the pain, terror, but also the path to recovery. And I think Mm -hmm. nonverbal communication is huge. It is a huge way in which the gallery contributes to both the public's understanding and to members getting better. That's wonderful. I just think that's such a strong component of what sets Fountain House apart from, you know, other organizations. And I think it's really great. And speaking of that, (laughs) what is the virtual clubhouse? Well, that really evolved as a result of the Mm COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And at the time when this was emerging, it really threatened these brick and mortar communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Prior to that, Fountain House was evolving to outfit many of its strong partner clubhouses, what we call in the field like training bases and learning partners. Part of the Center for Leadership and Education's mission was to create learning networks. And at the time, we I think we named it the Learning Exchange. So it was really, right, Cyrus, it was Dr. Alan Doyle, I had, he had invited me in to sort of think through how can we take a brick and mortar community and move it virtually? And this is prior to the pandemic. And we were experimenting with various platforms. Uh, Ultimately, we settled on a WebEx platform system. And part of this project was to connect organizationally clubhouses that were somewhat isolated out there. Although we have this large network, information about learning, nuances about clubhouse practices was really slow to get out there. You either went to training, but there's no educational system where you could come to the university and say, I want to be a social practitioner. I want to work in clubhouse. And really to keep this movement learning, which is what my area is, moving. So we decided to investigate, can we move this brick and mortar community to these online spaces? Then, you know, between the years of 2015 and 2018, we Establish these wonderful social ex- learning exchange networks. And then the pandemic hit 19. And I think we were a bit above or a bit beyond or ahead of, you know, getting to this place of a virtual clubhouse community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And during that first year of the pandemic, we had conducted a couple of international studies about how were folks who were part of clubhouses, managing and dealing with being shuttered in. You know, here we spend all this time trying to get you to, well, you know, to come to the club, join the club, be part of the club. And now folks that wanted to be at the club couldn't be at the club. This allowed us to then work together with uh, Clubhouse International, which is the accreditation body for these models. Mm -hmm. And I started establishing webinars and reaching people. We did a study to really look at what clubhouses were doing. They were still checking in with members. We were getting information that members who were staying connected via phone, via any technologies, clubs were out there getting people the technology they needed to stay connected. And through that effort emerged sort of this virtual clubhouse community, which at Fountain House still exists. It may not be in the high numbers that it was during the time that we were all shuttered in, but that is also another area that I have a doctoral student who's interested in looking at. Why are people still coming to virtual clubhouse? What mm-hmm. are some of the unique nuances of a virtual clubhouse than a brick and mortar clubhouse? And given that we had established with the learning exchange that, yes, we can still develop these strong recovery communities beyond the walls of 47th and 9th. Mm-hmm. And that was essentially, I don't know if you remember Cyrus, Dr. Alan Doyle, what he would say, we got to move beyond 47th and 9th. Right, right. 
Yeah, I I would add to that. One of the things that came out of the pandemic is there was on our, I think it was on our Facebook page, a member from a clubhouse in Jerusalem, Israel, reached out to us and wanted to know how we were dealing with locking down New York City, which is where we're located, Uh shutting down the clubhouse. (laughs) And from that inquiry, I arranged for us to meet every single week for nearly a year where we were sharing our stories about how we were dealing with COVID, how were we dealing with lockdowns, really supporting each other, building relationships, building friendship. And after a certain period of time, I said, look, I love socializing. I love getting together, but what are we going to do? You know, Clubhouse is based on the work order day. So what we started doing is we would bring in special guests. We would Mm -hmm. spend time talking about the international standards, which are, they were 37 or 38. I never remember because they're working on a couple of new ones Mm -hmm. that are focused on things like education and employment and choice and governance and things like, you know, what were we doing on building our own virtual community in our own backyard? Mm -hmm. And it was tremendous. And there would probably be between 20 and 25 people that would meet every Thursday morning. You know, it was, I think, 8 a.m. here in New York, and I'm not a morning person. (laughs) I struggle with that, but I was there every week because I was hosting the meeting. Then we said, okay, we'll work on the action plan. So what are the clubhouses going to do? Because they were getting to reopen. And they came up with their own action plan as to how they were going to provide services and support as they slowly reopened clubhouses in Israel. And it was a wonderful experience. We did something similar on a smaller scale with clubhouses in Finland. And what we're looking at today is we have a virtual clubhouse team at Fountain House Mm -hmm. that has been developing a program where there are 14 clubhouses in New York, including one in New Jersey, that are part of the Clubhouse New York Coalition. And we're actually going to introduce virtual programming for the coalition and we'll focus on socialization as one aspect of virtual uh, clubhouse, but also we're going to work on a project or two. And we're going to see how we can engage multiple clubhouses using the technology to really engage people and get them involved. Because Fountain House really has about pre-pandemic, and I think the numbers are back up to almost pre-pandemic numbers, about 300 members coming in every single day. And of course, all the staff, we don't have any room to physically grow anymore in our physical structure. Mm -hmm. So using the virtual clubhouse to engage more people is another aspect of this that we're looking at. How do you use technology to reach more people? to really have an impact on loneliness and isolation. Particularly if you're not able to come to the clubhouse during the normal work order day because you have a job or you're in school and you're only available, say, in the evening. So another aspect that we were looking at, again, just prior to COVID was having Fountain House open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't think we're going to get back to that this year, but it was something that we were getting ready to implement. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these innovations that we're always looking at because we try to be intentional in everything that we do. And we're always looking, is this working? If it's not working, why isn't it working? What changes do we have to make to our programming? How do we engage more members? How do you use technology? Because technology is the reality of every day. I talked about it with the Silver Center, having iPads distributed to people who are in Nursing homes or assisted living facilities. How do you engage people who are working and raising a family and you want to provide them with these support? So these are the other ways and other things that we're looking at is using technology to really engage people in the virtual clubhouse. So check back in a year and we'll have some more information. (laughs) Excellent. Okay, well, that takes me to my final question, which is how can people become more involved with Fountain House? And I'm, we're definitely going to include the link on our show notes, but any additional resources or are there any ways that people can become more involved, both as clinicians and just members of society? 
I think for all the behavioral health providers who are listening, definitely come learn more about us. You know, mm-hmm. I personally vouch that if you want to come and do a tour of Fountain House, I will arrange that for you because oh, I want you to know. Wonderful. Uh, that's how I came here, you know, 16 mm-hmm. years ago, I mm-hmm. came on a tour and I was just wowed by how different this was mm-hmm. than anything I'd seen before in any clinical setting I'd seen before. And mm-hmm. I want people to know about it. There's virtual ways to, you know, take a look. A Magnolia Clubhouse in Ohio has a wonderful video of you know, that really showcases what Clubhouse is. Um, And if you follow us on TikTok or on LinkedIn or Facebook, you can definitely see all of the wonderful things that are happening all the time. But join the club at foundhouse.org. Email us if you have someone you think could be helped. And I didn't mention Mm -hmm. this earlier, but this link covers 14 clubhouses across New York City. So even if you're not living anywhere near you know, your patient or client isn't living near Hell's Kitchen. If they live in the far reaches of, you know, Queens, there's a clubhouse there and we will get them connected there. So <laughs> refer, um, get in touch with us to coordinate care and visit. Please do visit. But I think there's other ways that, you know, people who are not clinicians can get involved too. I mentioned the gallery. Come visit the gallery. Come look at the art. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll want to buy something, but just enjoy it and meet the members who are running that gallery. Mm-hmm. Come to Fountain House and Body in Soho. It is one of our social enterprises where our members make sustainable cleaning products and soaps and all kinds of things, cards, and you can buy those and you can interface with our members right in that shop, right in Soho and support the work that we do at Fountain House to boot. So there's many ways to get involved with Fountain House and we hope that you will because This is a really special place, and I feel very privileged to be part of it. I would add one of the things that we developed over uh, the pandemic or the WANA webinar series, which is on the Fountain House YouTube channel. Just type Fountain House in, and you'll see the WANA webinar playlist. And we've done 25 to date, ranging everything from virtual programming or hybrid clubhouse to education to employment how we just did one on incorporating multimedia into your clubhouse. Of course, we have a board of directors. We have a Fountain House Council, which focuses on things like buildings and residences. We're in the process of developing and building a new clubhouse in the South Bronx. And on the lot next door, we're going to put up a residential building to house more people. We are looking for people to become involved in a variety of different ways. So I would just reach out to he- us here at Fountain House. You can write to the Center for Leadership and Education, which I'm part of, if you have any questions about our colleague training program. So there are lots of things that we do. I would visit our fountainhouse.org, uh, our website, and we have a whole new section. We have a whole area uh, that explains what it is that we do. We are building a national network across the U.S. to help focus on a variety of different issues, such as how to better deal with somebody who is in a crisis situation. I don't know if Dr. C wants to talk a little bit about that. So there are lots of things that we're working on that we're really trying to be very creative and innovative about. Wow. Thank I you. I do so want much. to mention our partners in uh-huh. care cleaning that's yep, specifically thank you. We're designed just that. for <laughs> uh, yeah, for people with for people working in clinical behavioral health services so that you can understand how to best partner with the clubhouse. And you can access that. Actually, it's on the World Psychiatric Association okay. webpage now. We did a series of three trainings that you can get to continuing education for watching. And then you can also learn more about it on the foundhouse.org website as well. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being a part of our show and for sharing so much incredible information with us. This episode has truly been inspiring and I will definitely include any specific links and resources for people, but I think that a great start is the website. So thank you all of you. and. Um, Looking forward to hearing from you again in the future. I know we have some ideas lined up. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. 